Well, um, you know, I, we were enjoying that discussion about NHI so much. I thought we should just continue. <laughs> I don't know what you think. <laughs> you know, um, we've had some amazing uh, discussions over this conference, and uh, I was set a rather awesome task by the uh, conference committee. They said, reflections on a lifetime of learning and adapting in rural. Um, we've heard tremendous speakers, eloquent speakers. We've had tremendous plenary groups telling us about the issues around uh, nursing and therapy and clinical associates. And uh, we had Mayara telling us of the challenging example from Brazil, which we just mentioned again. Uh, and then they tack this on. And, you know, it's a problem because... Uh, and last night we were listening to these amazing award stories, you know, of, of people doing amazing things. I mean, it's just astonishing. And I think each of you also have your own story or stories, many stories probably, uh, which each in their own way are just as astounding. And then they asked me to give a reflection on a lifetime. But the problem is I hadn't had my lifetime yet. <laughs> But I am still learning. Um, I'm going to try and learn whether which go, goes forward and which goes back on this device to start with. Neither. <laughs> That's even better. Try this one. Oh, there you go. The back button goes forwards. So the limitation of reflections, one of the limitations of reflections is sometimes you get things upside down or back to front, as you can see. Um, in, a, in a reflection, and um, reflections can actually not really be the way things were, it's just a, a perception, you know, and uh, so it may be the way I recall things that happened and not the way that you, they actually happened, or the way that you saw them happen, um, and uh, It'll be personal experience, not a universal experience of healthcare in the system. Hopefully, however, you may be able to glean something from what I say to take home for yourself and adapt and apply to your own situation in some way within your profession. Um, they're not only personal reflections, but they're also localized. You heard I stayed in the same place you know, for a very long time. Uh, and it's northern KwaZulu-Natal, Mshabia-Lingan. And it was in a particular time. It was, not, it was 81 through to 2021, a very different time than 2021, 2041, which will be different and it'll have its own challenges. That's why we do need people who taught us in medical school, have given us all the answers to all the problems we're going to meet until we finish our professional career, whenever that is, into our box. But if you intend to set out on this journey, and for those who are younger, and you're thinking of prolonged rural placement, my advice would be it's a great idea to get a like-minded partner. Uh, as a medical student, I had found out that Rachel was set on such a life before I even went out for our first date. And in 1981, when we left London for Mussolini on our fourth year of marriage, uh, with one little baby in hand, uh, we uh, arrived looking like this. Um, she's the pretty one in the picture. And the, the second picture is something taken in 2018 um, after a very productive life, as you can see. Uh, this is my two sons and a daughter and two daughters-in-law and a son-in-law and three grandchildren. We now have four. Um, and what an, an interesting journey, very productive years. Uh, and, uh, yeah, but it was made possible because I had a wife, a social worker who's committed 
to family care and homeschooling in a rural area. Our children were cared for uh, for 16 years uh, and then they went away and came back with degrees. One of the most successful teachers I know, I think her whole class has earned uh, an average of about three and a half degrees. Uh, so that's quite high. Um, a very common reason for leaving rural practice is the partner is unhappy. Rachel was not only involved in caring for our children, she was deeply involved in caring for the community and doing the, uh, the Imselani Care and Compassions Ministry, Lula Sandler Um So other people leave the air, rural areas because of children's education. And my wife was ready to educate our children. So we could stay, whether we wanted to or not, I suppose. Um, yeah. Some, we, I remember one lady doctor who left us who was really very keen on rural medicine, but she met a nuclear medicine specialist uh, in her meanderings around, and they decided they were interested in each other. And I could not get the Department of Health, KwaZulu, KwaZulu, KwaZulu in those days, uh, to give us a cyclotron at Imselani. <laughs> so we had to wave goodbye. Um, some things just don't happen, however hard you try. Um, I do remember another doctor who left in Selene because he felt he was never going to find a partner in Selene. Um, and the next month, he left, I think, in the December, in the January, a young social worker came to Selene and started to work with us for the year. And a couple of weeks later, they met in a coffee shop in Cape Town. <laughs> And by sorry, not by arrangement, um, and formed a relationship, which then had to be a long distance dating relationship for a whole year, because he was in the wrong part of the world. So courtship can be a problem uh, for getting a partner. Of course, if you're in a rural area. Another doctor I remember who applied to come to Mussolini and he decided he was going to come and he did all the applications, you know, the, lots of paperwork, he'd do all these things, you get all the approvals. And then he said, oh yeah, but my wife, she's a professional singer and she needs to fly, you know, Joe Berg and internationally about every week. And it was the nearest airport. So, Choose carefully your partners if you want to do rural practice, um, because it can be for a life. So our title is um, Changing and Adapting, Learning and Adapting. And you need to have a basis if you want to adapt. You can't adapt nothing. So it's good to get knowledge and attitudes that will help you to give you a sound start. And you don't always know what you're going to need. So read the whole Bible, not just the Gospels. Yeah, you've got to read. I found pre-internet days, of course, that it was good to have some substantial textbooks, like the Oxford Textbook of Medicine, Harrison's, for Foreign and Neo Pediatrics, Alien Love, Operative Surgery by Rob Smith. What a wonderful set of volumes. Um, in 1984, um, Jerry Cavardia and uh, Walter Learning brought out a pediatrics and child health appropriate in South Africa. I think they're on the eighth or ninth edition. Don't know whether it's still going forward. I'd get the BMJ and the SAMJ and I would read it. Um, BMJ came in an airmail form. You could get it without all the adverts. You know, it's a lot, lot easier, a lot lighter, and you didn't have to pay so much for the postage. And then we had a journal club, the hospitals around us, and this was great. You know, we, we radio. It was radio. We didn't have cell phones in those days. Um, over. Um, <laughs> are you receiving me? Can you hear me? Over. Um, and it was Mosfeld, Manguzi, Bethesda, and Mussolini. 
there's a couple of doctors in each hospital and we get each week we get on the journal club and we discuss what was in the journals. Um, so we took what was still outside and it was very useful, very helpful um, for each of us. Uh, I think just the sense of contact and that we were real people and we're, we're, did us, our minds were still engaged was maybe helpful. In these days on the ward rounds, of course, we often resort to Google um, and uh, up to date and emergency medicine guidance have all been very useful and come up with some very interesting facts on the next patient. My interest in med mission medicine had been sparked by reading a biography, Paul Barant, which was called Ten Fingers for God, um, who's a, who worked in a leprosy colony uh, in India and became a, a very a hand surgeon with innovative techniques of tendon transplants to restore function. Um, so my attitudes were shaped by reading the Bible most days and authors such as Francis Schaeffer, great writer, Martin Lloyd-Jones, C.S. Lewis, Michael Griffiths, with a book called Give Up Your Small Ambitions. Uh, why, why dream small? Uh, and he was talking about living a life for God is so much better than just dreaming for a small little environment where you can grow a few flowers and drive a Rich Christians in an age of hunger, social responsibility in our lives. Um, Paul Tonier or John White, if money is not God, why is the church worshiping it? Uh, and Paul Tonier, a great writer with lots of good, good insights, and one book was a play. And um, library. I've taken putting a list of all of books that I think are useful for people to have sought out and read. Um, because I think it's great to attempt to read good books. I like to pick up guidance from people about books. You know, when I go and I say, well, what are you reading? What, what do you found good? I find that's helpful. Um, because there are so many books, as a very wise man once said, of the writing of books, there is no end, and the excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. Uh, so beyond the basis that you have to look at your situation, so you have to have a basis, you want to adapt, but then you have to start where you, that's your starting point, you have a basis, and you look at the situations you meet, and you analyze them, and you say, needed here is there already a solution i don't need to reinvent the wheel i just apply and if you haven't been looking in the books before you may not even recognize the problem i often found that like with diagnoses you you only see a diagnosis because you've read about it you don't make the diagnosis first and then read about it usually um, you happen to know that there is such a thing that exists. I remember when I was learning Zulu, we would, we would get the Zulu grammar out, you know, Nyambezi's learn Zulu, and we'd read this word and say, nobody ever uses that word around you. I've never heard it. And I'd walk out the door and three people would say it as I walked past in different places, because you hear what you already know and you learn that way. So you do need to um, open your mind by reading and looking to see the problems. And then you'd have to ask yourself, well, do I have what is needed to solve this problem? I mean, do I have the latest gizmo that's required? Have I got the, the UV light to give phototherapy? Or have I got a CPAP machine for this baby that can't breathe very well and needs a bit of extra pressure? And if you haven't, then you have to start thinking, well, what, what is it that it actually does? You know, light, you know, UV, what, what emits UV light? Well, actually, the ordinary fluorescent tubes also emit UV light. They just em emit a lot of other light as well. But there is a blue spectrum to what they emit. 
and people have shown that, in fact, they emit a significant amount, but it drops off over the hours they use them. So we took to using UV lights, and we'd use them first in the phototherapy unit, and we'd put right how many hours we'd use them for, and then when they'd been used for 100 hours, we'd swap them out, and we'd put them into the ordinary lights, the things in, around the hospital, and we put the new ones into the phototherapy unit. And apparently, they tell me, I didn't have a mon monitor to measure it, but they tell me the UV light emissions decrease over time. So we could use it, even though we didn't have the full gizmo. How do you get CPAP to a baby who's intubated and you haven't got a machine? They're spontaneously breathing. Well, you can put the exit from the intracule tube into, under some water. It's not that difficult. You know, it raises the pressure. And so you adapt what you know to find a solution to what you need. Um, traction bags. Obviously, the IV bags are very readily available to work as traction and weight and rope and string is usually available. Um, you don't have to have lots of specially labeled pieces of metal. You know, a litre weighs a kilogram, <laughs> approximately, but approximately enough for clinical practice. Um, but sometimes you can't do what you need to do with the things you have. Then you need to advocate. Can't always accept being inferior and that things are not what they need to be. And I think that was one of the situations we met very strongly with the HIV ARVs program, which was a big story and led to a lot of people getting in trouble. <laughs> uh, but it also was seen uh, to do some tremendous good when we got going. So I remember the ARV program, our first bit of ARVs was trying to do the maternal to child, child transmission and it was too complicated for us at that point to these these terrible regimes of AZT intravenously so many times before so many weeks before delivery and then after we just couldn't see a way through but then they came with this little nevirapine study that said well you could at least cut it in three you know if you just gave one tablet of nevirapine at delivery and then we had a drag your feet moment in public sector. And it was very painful. And so we just bought the Navarapine because they didn't want to accept the donation. It wasn't that expensive, but it did us a lot of good. Um, got us into a lot of trouble, uh, but it made us feel better about caring for our patients, didn't it? That we're at least doing something within our reach. And obviously we've achieved much better levels now with better regimes and the, the newer you know, transmission rate, uh, levels are so much better than they were. And you remember getting into trouble for introducing AZT. Yeah. So, um, but we don't always have to accept limitations. We need to be change agents if you want to go out to these places. So learning and adapting, but sometimes we need to adapt the environment to the patient, not the patient or the system. Uh, um, so, it's not always appropriate to just import what you did somewhere else into a new setting. And I discovered that when I, 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 I remember very early on, I had a diabetic patient and I thought, I'll just use this continuous infusion intra intravenous insulin regime management that I'd been using six months before in London. The, the problem was when I put the drip up, there was no good rate controller. The, you know, the, the rate was not controlled. And the nurses were not really used to this idea either. And it was only fortunate that they, I managed to see the patient go fast asleep before they completely stopped breathing and uh, stop the process. And I, I realized that sometimes you think what you normally do would always work, but it doesn't. Um, I've had surgeons come and start an operation and then halfway through they say, oh, and yes, and where is the such and such? And you don't have a such and such in your theater. And they say, what sort of theater are you? You don't have a Bristow's elevator? What do you call yourself, you know? Um, 
I remember I was uh, doing a total hip and cementing the prosthesis when the lights went out and the UPS did not kick in. Everything went dark. Uh, nobody had cell phones in those days, but there was a laryngoscope in the theater. <laughs> Before the cement set. So, yes, you, you, you have to make adjustments to what you've learned. But you do need a team in rural medicine. Uh, it's interesting uh, that God made so many people and he didn't make copies. He made differences. I mean, there are no two people here who look the same. No, they don't. They don't. They're very similar. They're very similar, but not the same. Even identical twins are not the same. But the, the whole system, uh, in order to cover the basis, you will never cover everything. Whoever you are, you need a team. You can't do everything. But you also need to know that if you need a team, you also need to keep a team if you want to be successful. You want to, so when you're treating your patients, you can't ignore your, your team. Your team is important to delivering care to your patients. The idea you can sacrifice your team in order to do something for your patient is bad. And it's usually self-centered. It's not really centered on your patient. Uh, the, the attitude that you just uh, are the only person who can do anything here really and the other people are just getting in the way comes over and it doesn't help. I like to say that, you know, I've, I've never been guilty of doing any of that myself. <laughs> Um, but if you want to learn, if you want others to learn from you, you actually have to be prepared to learn from others as well. It's a two-way street and there's lots in a team that you can gain. But the beauty of a team is not that people are all the same and doing the same thing. The beauty of it. And you know, people looking at how teams function say that in fact, the best teams don't necessarily all have all high functioning people. They have mixed ability people in a good functioning team. And people strong in some areas. The way to get things done is not to make everybody do the same thing, but to have a common purpose and for them to apply their skills in the direction. Uh, and obviously that's going to be an issue uh, with NHI, um, we need to find how we can get people to have common purpose. Sometimes we reduce people to common actions and we lose the benefit of the team. Because what we don't want is a whole series of cogs that are just turned by one team and churns out something at the end which is less than desirable. Um, so, I think God made people different for a reason. I do not like doing paperwork. Um, I'm glad there are some people who do, that they can they, they seem to have fun doing paperwork. Yeah. So we need a team. Around us. So if you're in, in rural practice, it's not the end of your learning. You know, I had a doctor who said to me, he, he came to Miscellany and he thought it was nowhere, uh, in the middle of nowhere. And he discovered it was somewhere. And lots of people le left saying they had learned so much. It was not a university. It was an existence. But you create the opportunity for learning. Opportunities of learning always crop up. Every patient is different. I asked a, a young doctor the other day, 
who, who in Peter Maransberg, I said, what did you, what did you learn today? Uh, oh no, I just did a diabetes clinic, she said. I said, what did you learn? She didn't, she didn't think that was what she was supposed to be doing. She was doing a diabetes clinic. I thought, that's strange. Every patient is new, different. We had a system in the, in the hospital of, of doing a ward round in the morning in which we went round. Now, I've been in places where you choo people choose to present particular patients that are interesting. Yeah. I said, no, let's see patient one by two, one, two, three, four, five, sequentially, not just the interesting patient. And why? Well, for two reasons. One is, it may be very, very interesting. You've never actually realized how interesting they are. Like the patient who had Guillain-Barre and was about to stop breathing on Friday morning in the ward round, uh, but no, the doctor had not realized that they needed to get them out and get them intubated. Yeah. So sometimes it's what they haven't seen that's very, very interesting. The other thing is that if you go patient by patient in the ward, you see common things often. So why is that important? Well, actually, seeing common things often means that you learn to do common things well. Yeah, that's why we have specialists, actually. That's why, because specialists try and have the less common things become more common in their clinic so they can manage them better. So, you know, obviously we should take the common things and do them well. And if we do the common things well, we will benefit more of the people. Yeah. So if we treat common ailments well, more of our patients will benefit from our care. So if we look at the interest, the esoteric, then most of our patients will have no benefit. So we would go patient by patient and we would discuss them. I, you know, people got very worried. I asked lots of questions and often people thought I was very, very clever because I had these amazing, I, I kept asking questions. I didn't know the answers. They didn't know that. I just asked the questions. <laughs> So that's the great thing. You just ask the questions. So they think you know the answers, and it's also, you know, you'll reveal it later. But they tell you the answers, and then you go on. So every patient is useful. Even the students are useful for learning. So not only do you teach the students, but the teach students teach you. So living in the bush for 40 years, you know, I couldn't trust that everything about HIV. I mean, it didn't exist student it had never been described okay and 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 similarly you know the other things i mean i'm sure recently you had that experience with covid you know but but um that was the way it was so things were being brought in all the time we had people coming in from outside and i love to have students and volunteer doctors and doctors coming for a year or two but it is also nice to have a strong core if you can keep them and that's very difficult but it's nice not to cut off the students from the system. I think recently we've had trouble with the uh, Department of Health sort of deciding that it's bad for us to have visiting students and making it very, very difficult. But um, it's a great learning opportunity. So every colleague is a learning opportunity. You know, even the cleaners can be a learning opportunity. You can learn from them as to what, why that's really happening there. You have to ask questions, but you must also read. So when, when you see a, a, a situation, it's great to then take that situation and then go back to the books and read again around the subject. You maybe haven't dealt with the patient with this problem for three months, and you, you just need to remind yourself what needs to be done. Read. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, Reading generally is always something I thought was useful as well. So I used to use, read a couple of chapters of a general medical textbook each day, um, non-specifically. And, you know, occasionally something from that would just pop up in the ward round. Uh, and sometimes you, it, it, because you'd read that it existed, you knew about this rare condition existed. You didn't know any more about it, but you sort of spotted something. And I remember um, one day, I was in, in outpatients and a patient came in and they were coughing and had a nosebleed and a fever. 
and I cleared the room for everybody. And I said, I think this hemorrhagic fever. I've never seen it before. So unfortunately, I had to look after that patient for the next 10 days because they had uh, Crimea Congo hemorrhagic fever and a couple of others came in after them and joined the queue and the designated doctor because we couldn't expose all the staff. So I had met them once, so they were mine. Um, yeah, you have to have read if you've heard about it. Our first case of cholera appeared in 84 um, when the ep epidemic, suddenly one patient the index case, and then the flood. Yeah, our first HIV patient. No, I can't possibly be HIV, don't believe it. You know, but you'd you read in the journal that this thing had existed. No, it won't get us. Of course it will. <laughs> yeah. So read generally, and then read specifically about your patient. No, still not going. So just in a, in a rural setting, the other thing I became very aware of is that it's not just the patient in front of you that's the patient. It's the whole community that is your patient. Um, and the whole community actually includes your staff as well. And actually includes yourself as well. Yeah, they're all your patients. So if you say you have an ambition to do something good for the patient, uh, you can't, you know, kill your staff in order to save the patient. It's not a direct swap, you know. Um, yes, there are sacrifices we make and it happens, but that's not the way we go. We try to make the situation as best it can be for everybody. We're looking for holistic care. We want the patients to benefit. The statement, the patient comes first, is a very misleading statement, I think. Uh, and often is to more to do with our pride about us possibly failing and being seen to fail because the patient does not survive or, or the patient is not cured for their disease and wanting to blame everybody else in the process. But in a community, all the needs are there. Not only do you treat the patient in front of you needs treating, but you need to consider all the needs of everybody else. But when you're doing that, when you treat that patient and you successfully treat a patient in a rural community, it's actually surprising how many other people know that you treated the patient, although you talk about confidentiality and other such things. We used to have, you know, you, you talk to a patient in the side room quietly and then go back into the general ward and the other patient next door would say, what did he say to you? And you say, oh, he said I got AIDS. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, so, you know, it's, and, and people would come and say, oh, yeah, you, you rescued my, my, my granny, you know, and, and thank you very much, and you meet them in the shops. And so you treat a whole community. When you treat somebody, you treat all their family, and you treat all the people around. But you also, when you're treating them, you mustn't forget the relatives that are standing there anxiously caring about them. And, and obviously this COVID thing has been very difficult. Uh, to, to care for the families of the people who are sick and to integrate them. When it, with our children, we always kept uh, a rooming in policy where mothers stayed with their babies. Um, and uh, we sometimes had to fight that when we came to planners who thought this was very untidy, made a mess, was difficult. They wanted a separate, they, they wanted, even if we had the mothers in the premises, they would like them in a, in a hut somewhere else, or in another room somewhere else, a lodge. Uh, and we said, no, they're with their babies. They can sleep in the same bed. Um, babies get better quicker with their mother with them. And they go home more efficiently too, because they don't hang around once they're well, they want to get out. <laughs> so you're not having to communicate back and forth. Also, you can find the information you need about your patient. So you treat the whole community, build a, build a system that will help everyone. Um, but not only were we trying to make people well uh, in the whole community, 
Uh, we would get involved in um, community issues, getting health information out there so that information gets around to other people. We'll come back to that probably. In public health, one of the things I discovered is that coverage is king, you know? If, if you are 99% successful treating people because you're very, very good at it, but you only treat 10% of those who need it, you will fail 81.1% of the time. If you're not so good and you can only achieve 90% success rate, but you do it for 90% of the people, you can succeed 81% of the time. And we had a, a problem with the ARV rollout, where there were some people who wanted to make ARV rollout, you know, it was specialist, it needed, it needed experts, it needed professors, it needed special units to deliver it. And we said, no, it's widespread, it needs people to get it. So what we did was we said, well, like, you know, we will do it at all our clinics. And on the day we got the drugs, every clinic started giving ARVs to patients. And it worked. And a couple of years later, I went to a, a talk and they wanted me to talk about bottlenecks in the delivery of ARVs. And I think this applies to more, more or less any type of general delivery, a bottleneck. Now, <coughs> So, if you think, sorry, I need to move around to the mic. Okay. If you think of a bottleneck, it suggests that uh, what's in the bottle eventually comes out slowly. Yeah? So, this is a bottle. And if we put this uh, restricted bottleneck on it, you will see what happens with the bottleneck. These are, these are all the patients who need treatment and this is the successfully treated patients. And as you see, you know, they dribble out. So there's some dribbling, a bit of, you know, sort of drips and dribbles and, and eventually you get some people, you know, treated and the others are still waiting. It may be waiting a year or two or three or four. Yeah. Oh, that's a bottleneck. That's a bottleneck. You see, so that's a bottleneck. So the patients are still waiting there. But what actually happened um, with ARVs was not so much a bottleneck. So this is, this is a funnel. Okay, and these are the patients needing treatment. Okay, and then they go, there's the patients needing treatment. She gets into the bottleneck, they're sort of pouring out the side. And when you stop, they're not there to treat anymore. And that's one of the concerns that we have in public health. Is that they say the great thing about doctors, they bury their mistakes. Public health king. So Yes, if we, can't, if we can't do it perfect, we'll need to do it. One of the things that my wife and I often said about various aspects of life was we had a motto, which was if a job's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. Now you've heard that motto before, where people say, if a job's worth doing, it's worth doing well. And I don't disagree with that, but the problem is that people stop there because I can't do it well, I won't do it. We say, actually, if it's worth doing, it's still worth having a go. And if nobody else is going to do it, then at least have a go. Um, and on that basis, I got involved in Varium Selene. Uh, my first, you know, I 
did uh, my first hysterectomy within a week of arriving. I had not done hysterectomy. I'd done obstetrics um, in the UK, but I'd not done hysterectomy. I'd done cesarean sections. And none of the other doctors had done a hysterectomy either. When this lady came in, needed had a ruptured uterus. And I had to choose between doing the anesthetic or the surgery. So I said, no, I'll do the surgery, you do the anesthetic. Because um, I was even less happy with the anesthetic. Um, so the book was read and we got on and the patient survived, uh, which is great news. So I, two weeks later, a similar circumstance arose as the expert. <laughs> But when you're communicating uh, with, about patients, don't just communicate about your patient, communicate with your patient. I remember a colleague, a nursing colleague at uh, Mussolini broke his neck in a car accident and was admitted to a center of excellence. And um, I went to see him a couple of weeks later, and I said to him, so who's your doctor? He says, I don't know, I've never seen him. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm, I'm in this traction and I'm looking straight up at the sky and he stands at the end of the bed. So we gave him a mirror. <laughs> so he could see him on the next ward round. I've seen people using translators interpreters yeah sometimes they're interrupters you see the difference um, some people can use an interpreter to communicate to somebody but a lot a lot of people talk to the interpreter about the patient to ask her does she have pain do you have pain <laughs> ask her where is the pain where is the <laughs> We need to learn, if we're going to need to use interpreters at times, because we don't, can't speak all the languages in the world, and there are a lot of languages in South Africa, but we need to learn to do it properly if you're going to do it. So if you're using an interpreter, talk to the patient. More than 50% of your communication is nonverbal anyway. So do all the nonverbal things like just as if they understood English. Actually, they might understand English, and you just don't know. Um, I, I spent a whole day with somebody once in, in a church somewhere, and then I met them in a meeting in, in, in the evening in someone else's house, and they were talking perfectly fluent English, and I hadn't a clue that they spoke English. So, you know, you can be surprised. Um, so, but, you know, talk to your patients. One of the great problems I often faced was the, the patient returning from a referral. You'd send them all the way to Durban. It would have taken them a day down and a day back. You say to them, what did the doctor say? He said, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> what did the doctor? That's terrible. So talk to your patients. You might discover something interesting. You might even find, you know, that you, you learn more about what's wrong with them. They might have some words of encouragement for you too. Um, I, I've had doctors in interpersonal relationship who can engage in somebody totally not speaking their language. And my daughter um, quite likes this sort of thing. So one day we had a visiting team of people, uh, a Christian Medical Fellowship student and a, a doctor um, had come up to the hospital. I had cut, my daughter had a cousin there and the three of them sat in a circle and the cousin spoke Welsh and my daughter spoke in Zulu and the visiting doctor from the CMF spoke in Afrikaans and nobody understood the other person's language. It was so funny. That was just done deliberately, you know, but you can have a lot of fun with language. So, you know, but you can communicate even when you can't speak. Um, time is going, whoops, medicine's fascinating, I didn't put these, I, these are not particularly special x-rays, it's just a, an example of medicine because of the knee there, it's chest, bad hip, you know. Um, when I first arrived in Selenia, the, the doctor put up an x-ray and said to me, what's this? And I said, I don't know, it could be, could be this, could be that, could be the other, he said, it's TV. Um, <laughs> you know, obviously common things are common, 
and context does determine what you're looking at, doesn't it? So, but, but, but medicine is amazing. I mean, you, the, the things, you could talk about what, what strange things have happened, um, but you've got to keep your eyes open and keep on learning. Uh, it is just fascinating. And, and rural practice, yeah, I, I even at the last days, I always say to people, every day I was on call, I would wonder what on earth is going to come in today? What is going to come in today? I saw some very strange things. I remember one, one patient coming in with a, a thorn in their chest, a, an acacia thorn, and it was stuck here, and it was going boom, 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 boom. <laughs> Do I pull? Do I push? <laughs> I remember my first uh, extra uterine pre full term pregnancy, you know. And she'd come in, we was pre-ultrasound days, and she came into the hospital with a high breach. And I, you know, felt this thing. I thought, oh, I'll do an ECV. It's very high. I'll just do an ECV. And I turned the thing around, turned beautifully. Um, and then I took my hands off and it spanned back again. I thought, oh, that was a bit odd. So I put it in my odd box. I didn't know where to put it, you know. So I said, you're odd. You must stay in. And she went into the ward. Well, during the night, she got acute abdominal pain. But the nurses were very considerate, so they didn't call me. They just gave her some antacids and said, wait for the doctor in the morning. So I got to the ward in the morning, and they said, oh, that lady, she had a very bad pain in her abdomen. So I go to see her, and I put my hand on her abdomen. It's like a board, rigid. And I listened to the heart, the fetal heart's still there. And I said, I don't want that's happened. So I wasn't thinking extra uterine pregnancy. I was just thinking, I don't know what's happened. She must have something wrong in her abdomen. We'll need to do a laparotomy. So I called my colleague. I said, let's do it. We need, we need the GA. And put her on the table, give the GA. And I put my hand on her abdomen. And I say, the baby's not in the uterus. So I thought maybe ruptured uterus. But when I opened it, the placenta was on the outside of the uterus. And what had happened to the baby, the, the sac had burst. And the amniotic fluid was irritating the the bowel. Um, another occasion, we had a patient with ectop, uh, a similar condition, but they, she'd been in the ward a couple of days, not well, and they'd been discussing it with the obstetrician. The obstetrician said, no, it's pneumonia, it's pneumonia. She got a bit of chest pain, it's no, nothing, you know, it's comp. They, they wouldn't send, wouldn't accept the patient at referral. And Jenny said to me, you need to come and have a look at this patient. And as she was standing there, I was going to look at the patient, she said, I put my hand on this. She said, we, we need to think outside the box. We need to think outside the box. And I said, yes, Jenny, you're absolutely right. The baby is outside the box. <laughs> uh, yes, so interesting things happen. Um, yeah, we've had... Uh, uh, I, I do remember another patient was very interesting. It was a guy who had a, had a bladder a problem passing urine. He couldn't pass urine. Put a catheter in, I got three and a half liters of urine. I thought that's a bit much. Anyway, the catheter stayed in a day, he was draining urine fine, so he took the catheter out, he stopped passing urine. And uh, we waited half thing, put the catheter in, four liters of urine. Now, this man had been in a motor car and he traveled up on this motor car and had an accident and had been admitted to another hospital overnight, had been discharged the next morning, had got in another car, driven somewhere else and had another accident, was admitted to another hospital for a few hours, was discharged, got in another car, drove and had another accident. He was not the driver in any of these cars, he was the passenger. So that was the funny thing about it. Obviously. He had an intra-abdominal ruptured bladder, and all the urine was collecting in his in his uh, in his in his uh, peritoneal space. Um, easily resolved, you know, just little few stitches, solve the problem. But what really amazed me was that he he was a real Jonah. Um, <laughs> you don't want him in your boat. <laughs> I could talk for hours about interesting uh, medicine, I guess. Um, it lost its uh, 
picture. Uh, it's lost something now. It's lost the signal. Um, health is more than medicine and wealth is more than money. I actually had a picture of the, uh, uh, of, the of the writing there as a wealth. Uh, the new letter that we were introduced to about 10 years ago in Rudas meeting, I think, which is a convert hybrid W and H. Um, but, you know, having health is more than just clinical medicine too, isn't it? Um, it's a whole society issue uh, to be healthy. Um, and and to be wealthy is definitely more than money. I, I've seen a lot of poor, wealthy people. They have a, a rich life, and I've got five minutes. Uh, they have a rich life, and you don't need to have money necessarily. You know, you know people actually pay masses of money to go on holiday to where I was working. <laughs> and and to, to, to drive places and see the animals that stop me on the way to clinic. <laughs> yeah. So your patients need more, need your humanity, not just your technology, yeah? They need your humanity. They need to contact with you. Uh, Steve Reed organized a, a video at one point, a little, a little film of, um, of the hospitals in Maputaland, medicine in Maputaland, I think it's called, isn't it? A recruitment. For, and on this thing, there's one cleaner at, at the hospital, I think Manguzi Hospital, who says, you know, the doctor who says hello to you in the morning makes you feel good. And yes, and she says, you may be dying, but you feel better. <laughs> So they need your humanity. So don't forget who you, you are a human being. Uh, this patient turned 77 as she'd had a stroke in hospital and her daughter was there with her. So we made a cake for her birthday. It's probably the first birthday cake she ever had in her life. And her daughter probably appreciated more than she did. But then you treat the whole community, don't you? Not just the patient. Um, rural doctors are also very well positioned to be involved in development of the community. Not just because you have people who are engineers who then go into medicine, um, but we do, of course. Um, but you have access to people in power as a doctor, and you may not believe it. But it's amazing. I mean, when you say to suddenly relationships change and, and are you going to use it for other people because you can have a massive impact in a community i could speak to any in Kosi when i wanted to i could i could also speak to the minister of health yeah the premier of the province knew who i was i had a voice because I was a doctor, they always listen to me and do what I told them. That's true, but at least they did hear something. I could talk, and I, I realized that even even as a young man in the early days, that there was something special about that. You know, I remember getting stopped in Johannesburg, going to a wedding of Joyce Marshall, I think it was, and and the policeman came up behind me. It was. I was coming up towards a traffic light and it changed red. And there was a car right behind me. So I thought, no, you know, if I pan my check, stop now, you'll run into the back. So I drove across, you see? And blue light came on. <laughs> and this car drew up behind me and I stopped and I got out and said, what, you know? And he said, well, who are you? I said, oh, I'm a doctor from, oh, a doctor. Uh, okay, off you go. <laughs> Yeah. But we were able to do a lot of things in the developed water systems uh, because we had the access. I sat in a, in a meeting in, uh, in Alundi, we had a, a meeting of, of provincial secretaries and uh, discussing the issue of people with MJD needing services. And we were able to bring things to them. But I remember being in one meeting and talking about water and we'd been about 20 minutes and the, the guy said to me, he said, 
you're talking about a tap. I thought we were talking about a well. A water pipe is a luxury, he says. I said to him, that's interesting. I said, have you ever lived in a house without a water tap? And he stopped. He was in his 40s or 50s. And he thought, and he, turned, he said to me, no, you're right, Dr. Fred, and I never have. And he sponsored the first water pipe at Msalani from the Sugar Association. 40,000 rand, and we put in a pipe running from the hospital two kilometers down the road, and stand taps along the road. So you can sometimes be successful, as well as have a voice. You also don't have to be people in order to help them. I think I've just used my time. So I just want to say, you know, people are not waiting for you to be the same as them. You are who you are. They want you to care for them as for who they are. It's not by being the same that we care for people. We care for people as they are. I care for people who disagree with me, as well as those who agree with me. But I don't change and say, oh, then you're right and I'm wrong. I still stand where I am. I still believe what I believe. Uh, but being different is not bad. So don't leave your own ethics at home. Be who you are. Be authentic. You see, people who say to you, you should not give your opinions to other people about what is right and what is wrong. What opinion are they giving? Whose opinion? Their opinion. Why do they give it? If they believe it's wrong to give it. Uh, is it wrong as a doctor to be prescriptive? We're licensed to prescribe. <laughs> I, I would say some other things, and obviously people, just bear in mind that what you, we think we're doing and what people perceive are not always or even ever the same. Don't be surprised. But I do want to finish with a song, um, because I said I would. <laughs> no, not just because I said I would, I, I like singing. Uh, and uh, the song I want to finish with is, is about learning. Uh, but it's learning from God. Um, we need to walk humbly in this world because we certainly don't know everything. And the more you do get to know, the more you realize you don't know. Um, so my, it's my prayer that I can go with my Lord and that he'll teach me. Now we're... 